This program is brought to you by Pussy Magnets. Put a binge on your friend with a Pussy Magnet. Welcome, welcome, my lovely lumps. Or should I say lovely labs? I'm so thrilled to have you here in the Labia Lounge to yarn about all things sexuality, womanhood, holistic health, and everything in between. Your legs. <laughs> Ah, can never help myself. Anyway, we're going to have vag loads of real chats with real people about real shit. So buckle up, you're about to receive the sex ed that you never had and have a bloody good laugh while you're at it. Before we get stuck in, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this, the Manang people. It's an absolute privilege to be living and creating dope podcast content on Noongar country, and I pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, if you're all ready, let's flap and do this. <laughs> oh God, is there such thing as too many vagina jokes in the one intro? <laughs> Whatever, I'm leaving it in. It's my podcast. Don't panic, you're not broken. Your sex education was a piece of shit. Get your flaps out and pull up the couch. It's the Labia Lounge. Welcome, welcome, my Labia love bugs. So happy to have you back in the lounge today because I've got a pretty special guest. I'm going to give you the full professional bio and then I'm going to launch into grilling her about all sorts of juicy topics and see where it takes us. So welcome to my dear guest, Saida Desale. Oh, shit. I was going to check with you before we press record. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, Saida Desale, exactly. All right, beautiful. And Saida wants to live in a world filled with audacious, sexually sovereign people living life on their own terms. As a TEDx speaker, researcher, counterculture creatrix, body philosopher, and author, her work has touched the lives of millions globally. Dr. Saida's innovative approach to psychosexuality, desire, and pleasure invites both the public and professionals to better understand the importance of accessing their erotic genius. Her medically endorsed method integrates somatic awareness, neural and cellular repatterning, and robust reframes of sensuality and sex, which all work in harmony to support the erotic individuation process. Okay, there's some words in there that I want to dig into a little bit. Welcome, my love. So yeah, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Freya. Pleasure, treasure. So I want to chat a bit about jade egg practices at some point, but for now, just because it's piqued my curiosity and I think there's a few people that wouldn't really understand what these words mean, um, I'd love you to talk us through what what does it mean to you to be sexually sovereign or have body sovereignty? Because you mentioned that in your bio and I'd love to dig into that. Yeah, great. So I want to first define the two words and then how I came to putting them together, because I think that's instrumental. And now I'm actually hearing those words everywhere. But back mm -hmm. when I first was thinking about them and writing about them, I wasn't hearing them anywhere. And I think that was back right. in 2007 or something, uh, the, one mm -hmm. of the articles that I wrote. So sexual, kind of obvious, has to do with sexuality, body, genitals, all of that. Sovereignty, uh, normally associated with a king or queen or a country, something that is um, able to function on their own, fully autonomous, has their own volition and ability to set limits and also be generative. So when I thought about what was happening to, at that time, I was teaching all over the world, probably like 20 weekends a year in maybe 15, 16 Whoa. different countries. So it was a lot. Yeah, it was a lot. And, but though there were many different cultures, age groups, backgrounds, class, what I was witnessing over and over again was taking my breath away and I needed a way to define that. And so sexual sovereignty emerged as I started to contemplate it because I was like, wow, these women are truly coming into their own. They're truly finding home base, let's call it in themselves through direct contact with their sexuality. And then I, I looked at the human charter of rights uh, for many countries and I still haven't, I hope to be corrected, but I still have not found one that where your body, you don't have the right to your own 
body. You have more property rights than the right to your own body. So I thought, well, this is bizarre. And then it makes sense. We have more slavery right now in the world than we have at any other time in history. We have more um, gender-based violence and abuse than we've ever had. So partly that's numbers because we have a, a bigger population. Um, but what was struck me was I think people who wrote the Charter of Rights have never had to contemplate the, the issue around choosing for their body. It's not a thought process, but they did mm -hmm. contemplate like what happens with my property, what happens with, you know, this or that. So uh, sexual sovereignty was born. I started to write a lot about it. I started to teach about it. And then I started training professionals in it because it really started to make sense that we as professionals were not actually respectful of someone's sexual sovereignty, meaning there's we're well intended to support people to explore, but we often will kind of put our lens of perception onto sexuality and then encourage the people that we're influencing to adopt that lens. But to me, that's incredibly disrespectful. So with, with the work and what I saw, it's, it's not about me. It's not about my definitions. It's actually providing simply the space for an individual to make contact with themselves and start to self-define and self-regulate. Uh, mm, wow. Yeah, cool. It is, it is uh, a word or, you know, this is a phrase that I've heard quite a lot in recent years, so it's interesting to hear you kind of claim that as like, um, okay, I fucking came up. I started saying that ages ago, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe someone else had somewhere else, you know, it's the 100th monkey thing. But at that time, there was no one talking about it. It was confusing people. You could probably find the article, actually. Uh, it's, old, or like it's old now. Uh, but yeah, around 2006, 2007 is when I finally, I said, I need to publish this because I'm using these words and everyone else is going to start using my words. So that's just been my entire career um, yeah. to be like replicated over and over again. It's mm. slightly annoying, but it's supposed to be flattering. <laughs> <laughs> so, but at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to build this as a global community. And uh, so if people actually start to properly use sexual sovereignty, so what I mean by that, I'm also talking to governmental bodies and uh, lawyers and, and people who have the ability to actually bring this into law. And they've all poo-pooed the idea. They're like, no, you know, da, da, da. and I said, okay, I'm not going to wait for institutions and laws to catch up. I'm going to empower the individual. And when there's enough individuals who take a stand for this, it will have to change. Institutions will have to change and the laws will have to change. Mm -mm. Mm, totally. So could you give a really basic example of, uh, say, someone or, or a way that we are commonly not embodying our own sexual sovereignty and then an example of someone who really is uh, claiming their sexual sovereignty and living from that place, just to give like a, a practical example to wrap our heads around it even even further. Yeah, oh, I'll give really basic examples, ordinary examples. So if we don't know that we have full authority of our body, especially our genitals, then for women, say, going to a pelvic exam and the doctor does not actually ask permission to enter the speculum, we have uh, many massive opportunities for sexual trauma. So that is a lack of exercising both on behalf of the doctor and also the individual to establish, hey, this is my body. You need to check in with me. Um, I'm allowing you to look at my body and enter my body, but I'm allowing it. You're not just like you don't have the instant right to do that. It's not mm -hmm. unless I'm unconscious and I'm about to die, you do not have that right. So that's an example. I work with a lot of doctors and gynecologists, and it's one of the big ones that changes when they start to hear about this notion. Mm -hmm. And then one in terms of a positive would simply be a person who with themselves before they just shove, say, a tampon inside or a dildo or like, they actually just check in and is my body a yes or a no in this moment? So it could be as simple as those little gestures, but over time they really create an impact in the nervous system and the tissue health. Mm, yes. I love those examples. I'm often 
telling people just use the pap smear as as an example like you can ask to insert the speculum yourself you can ask for a mirror to check out your cervix you know and pretty much every time I've done that the doctors are so shocked but they're not going to say no if you're coming from this place of like well this is actually my body so give me a mirror or let me do you know it's not up to you and I'm not letting you just insert something into my body willy-nilly unless you know you have my permission and right now I'm wanting to do that myself so it's not for everyone you know being quite that sovereign yeah maybe you don't want to put the speculum in and that is also fine but you know maybe even just making sure they're pausing and and saying hey would Mm -hmm. you mind just letting me um have a moment to breathe and just asking me before you put the speculum in and and getting a verbal confirmation from me first that would help me to feel empowered and you know exactly in control so yeah I love I love that it really does make a difference like being a really good gatekeeper to your body and your pussy really does make a difference to the tissues and your nervous system so cool and then the other thing that um got me thinking from your bio there was a fair few words in there that I was like oh okay interesting I'm gonna get her to explain that erotic individuation and solo cultivation these are things that you uh, like to talk about and they're not the most common terms as far as I'm aware so what are yeah Maybe talk a little bit about erotic individuation and solo cultivation, if you could. Sure. So erotic, um, let's do solo cultivation first. This is a term that's been around a long time. It's not my terminology. It comes, I adapted it from a Taoist lineage. So I was uh, trained in many different lineages. In that particular lineage, they're really strong on practicing on your own to cultivate your sexual energy. So it's called solo cultivation. And so think of it as intentional self-pleasuring. So it's not just self-pleasuring to get off. It's intentional to train your mind, to train your body, to heighten the nervous system. So you can actually increase your capacity for pleasure and bliss to levels that are not typically known. So that's what solo cultivation is and I'm a huge advocate of it and we can talk more about that later but I actually think it could change uh, many of the issues that we're having in the world with gender violence for example Mm -hmm. and then uh, erotic individuation is a very recent idea that it came up with maybe a year and a half ago Um, also wrote an article on that it's on medium so you can check that out And it's basically, I started to understand because I'm training so many professionals and I've trained a lot of people and I still do, and I'm still working directly with human beings. And the thing that I started to realize is all these good intentions that we have as practitioners are still in some way harming the actual evolution of someone's individuation process erotically because There's so many ideas that we just adopt. I can actually tell when I hear someone speak what book they read, what school they went to, which teacher they spent time with, because there's no original thought. Everyone's just parroting a very tiny amount of information, whether they're parroting gynecological stuff from medicine, because they don't really learn much about pleasure in that realm, or in the kind of neosexual movement that we have now. I definitely, it's a tiny little box of thought. So what that does is uh, if you don't take that into consideration, and I think sex therapists are really the ones doing the worst job of it because whatever their schooling is, it's so tight and they themselves don't seem to be having extraordinary sex and they don't seem that adventurous. So it's when they're giving advice, it's really not in alignment usually with the truth of the individual. So it's very, very important. I argue deeply that we need to provide opportunities, but we need to also understand that in those moments, this person is very vulnerable and we have the opportunity to support a really beautiful unfoldment of this person becoming more of themselves erotically. And that requires deep respect of the erotic, uh, intelligence in the other person. And I don't see that very much. I see Tantra teachers, Taoist teachers, conscious sexuality teachers, doctors, therapists, everyone has this assumption. I know better. 
the way I think is better. This person's kind of broken or has no idea what's going on. I'm the one that's going to help them have this massive, you know, multi-orgasmic breakthrough. I'm really special because I can do that. Meanwhile, no one's serving the individual. So that's why I argue that and I speak really intensely about it. But if we're really here to help people grow erotically, then let's take that into consideration. And this is a beautiful journey, Freya, that just goes on throughout the lifetime of a person. We don't stop evolving erotically until our last breath. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's like something that I feel really strongly about as well, because Oh, if we if we are looking to these sort of I don't know philosophies or uh, blueprints for sexuality, generally we're going to compare ourselves and come up short and be like, but that's not how I work, or that's that doesn't really resonate with me. So maybe there must be something wrong with me. And so I like to provide, I guess, a safe space, similarly to how how you're sort of framing it, for people to go on a journey and discover their own bodies and their own likes and dislikes and desires and boundaries for themselves and know that that's an ever-evolving, ever-changing inner landscape and it might be different, you know, with one partner to the next or when they're on their own. And it's more about, I guess, my focus is more about helping people learn their own bodies and learn to trust their own bodies and intuition as gospel rather than following, you know, oh, you've got to like sublimate your chi <laughs> or you've got to do this many um, downward dogs and then hold your breath and, um, you know, <laughs> squeeze your pelvic floor like 10 times. And yes. it's just like, I mean, firstly, there's never a one size fits all. Um, but what what I was like thinking when you were talking was, what? How do you feel about? Because obviously, you know, you must have done various trainings. Um, I've sort of entered the sacred sexuality world with that neo tantra scene, and I've talked about that on the podcast and the pitfalls of that and why I moved away from that. Um, but I've got different trainings and I've done different, you know, I've got different influences and I've sort of cherry picked the things that I like and that resonate. And then it's like I kind of offer people a smorgasbord of um, different ideas or concepts, but I don't try to like force a particular um, framework on anyone. But what, how do you, how do you then, I guess, facilitate growth and learning and how do you teach professionals and individuals without um, how do you feel about like using other influences and information that you've learned along the way? Because sometimes it might feel a bit like appropriation. Um, sometimes, yeah, I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts on that? I'm not articulating this very well, but do you yeah, kind of know I, I get, yeah, I get what you mean. Yes. So in, in science, I'm a researcher. So in science, what we do is we build, it's, we build upon the, the insights and breakthroughs of, of the people before us. So that's actually healthy because we want things to evolve and grow and we want it to be solid on a foundation. So we're not just pulling something out of thin air and going, oh, this works, you know, because I, it works for me. <laughs> um, so there's a foundation of something concrete that other people have examined and looked at. There's a articulation of limitation because no thought, no human, no lineage, no one person is complete in, in, a, in a systematic way. We're, we're an interwoven uh, species. So it takes multi facets and multi layers to really understand the fullness of the beauty that's available there. So that's why the research is often done by multiple different points of views and different people and sometimes repeated and different results happen. So in that sense, when you're exposed to different teachers and different lineages, it's really important. Yes, absolutely respect. Like if this person's a genuine teacher and they put in the work and they're really holding the truth of that particular piece, respect that, but also understand that it's limited. It's not, it's not God and take from it the things that truly do resonate. But what I have found for me is that the average person does not want to be a really intense practitioner that requires nine hours of practice a day. The average person can't even stand being in their own body. Mm. And so if you don't like your body, 
if you don't like yourself, you're not going to have a very wide spectrum of pleasure available to you. So what I started to do is thank you to all the teachers, all the lineages, whether it's a scientific and more medical side or psychology side or Tantra or Taoist or any of those other kinds of viewpoints, giving thanks to those things, the healing modalities I've learned, the, the movement modalities. I used to be a martial artist as well as a professional dancer. Like I've learned an, a lot. I used to be a masseuse. I learned many different styles, aromatherapist. Like there's so many things that we can learn and, and pull from. At the end of the day, each teacher it becomes a, a culmination of what we most embody. So if you're just parroting information, it has no impact. Yes, people will hear it and it might look impressive. The thing that has impact that people need to realize is your limbic resonance. It's the actual real embodiment. So if you haven't really practiced, if you haven't tested something and really felt it in your entirety of your being and made it your own, your words are empty. Your gestures are empty. And there's very little, the impact is not, going to last very long, if, if at all. So limbic imprinting, limbic resonance, these are um, more scientific words to describe love, <laughs> the, the open nervous system of the human being. But they actually are, are what I have found are the most impactful. So that's what I pay attention to when I see a speaker or a teacher is how much limbic resonance is there behind the gestures and the words. And from a very young age, if someone wasn't embodied, but really like speaking a lot, I couldn't hear what they were saying. Like their mouth would move. And I'm like, what? I see the mouth moving, but I don't hear anything. It was a very strange experience. I mean, it heard sound, but nothing was really going in. And then I'd meet someone else who was kind of ordinary and they wouldn't even, I mean, I met a silent monk once. And the impact of his presence on my life was absolutely profound. And he never said a thing to me. So there's the limbic uh, resonance, first of all. Whoever has that strongest embodiment is the influencer of the space. So if you're a doctor, for example, and you, you have a client coming in who's scared, you have the opportunity through limbic resonance to calm their nervous system by calming your own nervous system. You have the opportunity through having seen this problem resolved many times to imbue confidence that it is possible for healing, et cetera, et cetera. So that's more where I come from. It's less about words. It's more about embodiment and transmission of that embodiment. And that sounds woo, but it's actually part of how the mammalian brain works we influence each other far more through our beingness than when we do through our speakingness. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Big believer in that. And it's, it's sad though to me that a lot of us have been conditioned and battered to the point where we struggle to, uh, I guess, remember how to actually listen to that. Like I think when it comes to things like, Ah. gurus or even just doctors like doctor knows best or like we're looking to find that person to tell us what to do tell us how to fix ourselves yes. and we're kind of blindly following people um and sometimes the most vulnerable people are doing that and following someone else because they've lost touch with that ability to actually check in and be like, am I resonating with this person on an embodied level? And does it feel right? Does it sit right with me? Um, am I yes. drawn to them for that reason? Or am I drawn to them because I'm feeling this like, you know, utter sense of lack in myself and I'm seeking something, anything, anyone to kind of feel that and tell me where to do, where to go and what to do and stuff. Yes. So I feel like when I was in like early in my, my journey with my own self work and finding myself on this path of trying to heal my own sexual trauma and uh, hang ups, I think I was definitely vulnerable to following people that just talked the talk and they said the right things. And intellectually, because I was so much more, um, in touch with my cognitive side, you know, I was like 
in my head all the time, I would find these people that were like talking to my head and be like, oh, they sound like they know their shit. Okay. Like I'm going to follow them. Whereas now like moving from a more embodied space and a space where I can tap into my intuition and, um, I guess just not blindly follow, um, it is interesting how differently I see, uh, I'm more like, you know, how you described, you sort of see their mouth moving, but you're like, oof, it seems hollow. It seems empty. Like the way that you're holding yourself and the way that you're kind of, you know, resonating with my nervous system is just not, it's not where it's at for me. So, um, yes. yeah, interesting. And I'm, I'm guessing that's something that you really help people reconnect with is like their ability to actually be so embodied that they're, they're receiving the right sort of people rather than just seeking the thing that their head's telling them is good for them. Yeah. And, and this comes from, I mean, I started on this path very young, very, very young. Um, I nearly died at the age of 20 from a really violent rape. I was given two weeks to live and I had to figure stuff out and I chose to live, but I had no help. I had no mentors. I had no, I didn't even know conscious sex existed then. It wasn't in my sphere of awareness. And so I was led, um, on a very, you know, you're intensely like, I need to live. It's, it's not like a joke. So it's a very intense time of coming back into one's body and really feeling one's body and really like being discerning and having a million and one opinions. I mean, my surgeon said I had two weeks to live. I chose to defy that verdict and say, well, no, I'm choosing. I'm actually going to live. And for a person to do that, uh, it takes some volition, I think, because a lot of us, we would have believed the doctor and probably died. So mm -hmm. there was a feistiness in me. It's always been there. Um, but it led me on this path. And as I started to get exposed, my first teachers were both in the tantric and Taoist l lineages, and none of them had impeccability. Uh, the Tantra groups I went to um, used pretty names to call me goddess and Shakti, you know, but they just wanted to fuck me. There was really nothing else going there. It was just conscious sex, par not even conscious sex, but just sex parties. Um, and it freaked me out. Um, the Taoist, original Taoist teachers I had basically convinced me that if I had sex with them, I would learn the special techniques and get the transmissions so, you know, I did all that because you're young and you, you want to learn and you don't know. So very early on when I wrote my first book, um, back in 2003, I write in a chapter saying, please, like if anyone tries to tell you that it's not in you run away, like everything that's what sexual sovereignty is about. Erotic can tell it, we have it all here. So my mission is to really help every single individual to feel confident about their own knowledge, even though it's asleep right now, possibly it's there and to start tapping into it in a rhythm and pace that is authentic and true for them. And that we don't have to go into fancy things and do special things and have sex with all kinds of, we could do that, but we don't have to do that. Uh, in order to have the healing or the awakening or the whatever it is that we're seeking. So I speak really strongly about that in that first book, and I have never stopped speaking about it. And now I'm actually called to come into groups where I'm leading the highest level practitioners on this planet to face their shadows because the lack of integrity in this field of work is insane and off the charts. But I started to realize this is everywhere. It's not just in this body of work. It's just that in this body of work, we, we choose to blindly believe that anyone who's talking about sex is some kind of masterful person when actually most of the time they're just wounded and healing and on a path of discovery and really don't know that much more than you do. They just read a couple extra books or went to a weekend workshop. So I'm really, um, a proponent for yes, learn, but be discerning. And the number one teacher is going to be yourself, your body, like how much your body communicates, doesn't communicate what you're feeling, what you're not feeling. And of course, having some guidance in the beginning is really important, but 
who is benefiting in that moment? Is it the egoic structure of that person leading you? Like, I am the best, look at me. Or is that person genuinely on your side and sitting with you through whatever it is and going, you've got this. This has nothing to do with me. You've got this. Because a lot of my students, they are just like, oh my God, this and that. I'm like, you did it. I didn't do the work. You did the work. I, I invited you to experiment with this or that, but you went out, you tried it, you, you're winning and it's because of you. So that's a very important part of sexual sovereignty. But also just if we think about it, Freya, the global idea around human beings deeply respecting human beings, deeply cultivating and bringing them into a place where they can feel fully individuated is just not in the collective. It's just not in the collective. So that's the inertia we're up against. And that's why I do have a lot of students. However, I'm not for everyone because I will not be your mother. I will not be your best friend but I will be there for you no matter what goes on. So it's, it's just, it's just a very important piece for me because I went through so much in my early years and I just was like, why I'm going to speak to this because I, I want to help young, especially young women who are incredibly gullible uh, to just develop some sense of authority and some sense of discernment very quickly. Like don't wait and the older women I work with, they're just, they go through a grieving process because like, why didn't I know this back when I was in my late teens, early 20s, right? There's a, a, a strong grieving process. I'm like, well, now you know now, so you can take advantage of that knowing now. And yes, of course, let's uh, release the grief, but at the same time, let's celebrate that you know now. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that comes up a lot in sessions with uh, older clients of mine, there's this real grief that they're only coming to this now and that they've kind of suffered, uh, you know, and, and feeling like they they've lost all of this time and now they've got to make up for lost time, but they're not going to get those years back. And, and yeah, it is, it is really sad when they realize just how much they didn't know and how much they could have, you know, had a different experience if they had have come to this work sooner, but you know, better than never, which most yeah, exactly, never, you know, like exactly. And know. one day of like a, of feeling your, your deep sensuality, one day of that eradicates decades of being asleep. So yeah. you can't measure time the same way. Once you mm-hmm. activate and open, as you know, Freya, like when you start to actually have a deep love affair with life, it's it changes everything time distance everything shifts because now you're having this exquisite love affair that's informing you with every single breath it's it's a very different way to live than to think that sex is something we do occasionally in the bedroom at this hour on this day Mm-mm. and i think there's such a beautiful role that these women can can play in the lives of the younger women that they you know like if they're you know sometimes I'll have clients who are postmenopausal and really just grieving that they didn't know this stuff sooner and I'm like yeah but you can break the cycle and you can pass that down to your daughters and that you know your granddaughters and you can be this embodied sort of transmission that is meaning that they're not going to have to go through the same thing that you went through. And like, sure, it would be nice if you had a, had someone do that for you, but you know, at least now, like there's nothing more rewarding than, than living it now and leading by example and seeing the effect that that has on those around you and getting to watch, you know, your grandkids, I'm, I'm sure watch them grow up and have completely different experience of their bodies and sexuality. Like how amazing, what a gift to give to the world. Exactly. Um, yeah, thank you for that really yeah, really personal and vulnerable share too. I didn't know that about your story and that just sounds so unbelievably horrific and like I mean obviously a huge catalyst for you and and now you are doing what you're doing from from a place of deep understanding of of sexual trauma and things like that. But yeah, wow. 
massive. So thank you for trusting me and my listeners with that info. Um, before we launch into talking about jade egg practices and a few other little things I've got on my list to grill you about, I'd love to do the segment Get Pregnant and Die. Don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. Don't have sex in the missionary position. Don't have, don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it. Promise? And this segment is where I ask all my guests if they have an anecdote about their sex education, uh, maybe something that was done horrifically, maybe something that was done well, maybe you like miraculously had a really great sex ed teacher, although I've never heard a story like that. Um, you know, maybe there's uh, something that you felt you would have liked to have learnt more about, pretty much any, any uh, sex ed related story that you feel to share. Hey, babe town. So sorry to interrupt, but I simply had to pop my head into the lounge here and mention another virtual lounge that you've got to get around. It's the Labia Lounge Facebook group that I've created for listeners of the potty to mingle in. And there you'll find extra bits and bobs like freebies or discounts for offerings from guests who've been interviewed on the podcast, inspiring and thought-provoking conversations, and support from a community of labial legends. I also have an account on the fab new app Sunroom, which is a platform created by women for women and non-binary folk, and where there's no shadow banning or censorship of sex-positive content unlike with the other platforms that I'm on. So you can hit up my sunroom for extra content and real and raw life updates because I'll be sharing on there from now on all of the stuff that I can't post anywhere else. My vision for both of these is that they become really supportive, educational and hilarious resources for you to have more access to me and a safe space to ask questions that you can't ask anywhere else. So head over to the links in the show notes and I'll hopefully see you in there. And now back to the episode. Yes. Um, I'm going to probably share something positive. Uh, the way in which I was brought up formed me profoundly as a sexual being. My parents are French Canadians who are, um, had their schooling with uh, priests and nuns. So a very religious, a strong religious background. And they did not want to impose the body as sin, pleasure as sin onto their kids. Uh, so my parents were very adamant I call it erotic innocence. So there's five stages of erotic evolution. The first one is erotic innocence. So they were really good at protecting that erotic innocence and cultivating it. So I, my mom says I came out of the womb like masturbating. She's, she's never seen anything like it. I was just always touching myself, always having little orgasms. And it was incredibly inappropriate. I mean, she'd have dinner guests over and I just decide that's the time to set myself up in the living room and go for it. So they, <laughs> they just, and they had such deep, healthy love between them. And I, because we were extremely poor, I grew up uh, in tents and abandoned homes and old trailers. And so you're always close to your parents. There's no bedrooms and they were young. They were going to have sex. So every once in a while, I would wake up. So my best sex ed was witnessing two people madly in love, expressing love. And so it was never sex in my brain. It never felt triggering. It felt safe. Um, they didn't know that I was watching. I didn't watch for long. I would just like look and then go back to sleep. But that had a really significant imprint on the healthiness of of sex because they were having great sex. So their limbic resonance in my field was amazing. They were deeply in love. They were lustful for each other. And I was free to explore my young body. And I was taught boundaries because we live in a very unsafe area. My father was like, no one else is allowed to touch you. You're going to tell me immediately if this happens. So I had from a very young age, a lot of good energy. And I was also witnessing horrific things because of where I lived, there was a lot of abuse and things. So the sex ed, the best sex that I had was literally my own body teaching myself. After my first menstrual cycle, I had my first ejaculation on my own. I wasn't doing anything special. It's just 
the hormones, I guess, were right for that experience. And there was no one talking about that. I couldn't even find anything about it in a dictionary because I was desperate trying to find information. <laughs> and I was a little too embarrassed to tell my mom I should have because she clearly years later, we talked about it, but she could have helped me with that. So my best sex ed was actually my own body because no one interfered with my erotic innocence, which then activated the natural intelligence and then what was being taught to me just seemed really stupid and out of place. So I never really took it in other than the fact that you can get pregnant and get some kind of disease if you do it with too many people. Like I, It was weird information. So I was like, okay, whatever. I just knew I wasn't going to have sex un until I was after like, like an actual adult. Whereas all my friends were already having babies by the time they were 12. So that's the environment I lived in. Whoa. So, it, and it wasn't that I was prudish. I just having great sex with myself and we're looking at teenage boys going, ah, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> like that's not going to be my first experience. I want something extraordinary as my first experience. So that's really my sex ed was that. And um, then life experience, obviously after that. Oh my God. I love all of that. What? That's uh, I'm a bit speechless because it's so rare to hear a story like that. Um, and I love that, yeah, even in living in these sorts of environments, your parents still managed to create such a safe bubble for you and protect you and teach you boundaries. And, yeah, like so fucking cool that you were just so in touch with your own pleasure and er in erotic innocence from a young age. And I feel like that's such a protective factor that prevents, you know, young girls from going and having shit sex and seeking validation and erotic exploration with other people because that's kind of the only way they know how to get it. Exactly. Um, I feel like if people were, you know, more like you were and just exploring their own bodies and getting a lot of a lot of enjoyment and connection and pleasure and fulfillment from that like why bother going with the gross pimply teenager that's going to like finger bang you with his dry grotty fingers and then tell everyone <laughs> that your pussy smells like fish like you know, that was yeah. very specific that didn't happen to me it happened to a friend of mine though and it was mortifying and that's what that's what like high school is kind of like unfortunately like for yeah. a lot of people and that's it's just, oh my God, it's quite amazing that you managed to dodge that. Oh, well, partly, yeah. Into sex. Yeah. Well, partly my house was a shelter for abused women. So at a very young age, I had a very sobering experience of mm. what, what beauty was in myself and with my witnessing my parents, but also what atrocity was because it was direct contact with it. I was abused by other girls. Um, sexually abused by other girls, uh, but they were acting out what was happening at home. So they were teenage girls. I was five years old and they just would do things to me, usually on the school grounds. So there was that part I wasn't really protected from, but I also, it never really like harmed me because I had too much goodness. I think I was just like, that's wrong. And I don't want that in my system, but I also never stopped touching myself and enjoying myself and um, all of that. So, yeah. And then I had files on all my teenage friends because I couldn't keep all the, the stories straight. So I was already doing like psychotherapy before I even knew what it was. <laughs> These file folders. And I was learning like, okay, well, I just didn't want to like, oh, so how is it with John? Meanwhile, it's Doug. And I'm like, oh, crap. So I had to just keep the stories straight and I had... <laughs> <laughs> these notes I would take and after listening to all my friends going through all these different things I'm like I don't want that that sounds awful like it's just they're constantly paranoid they're constantly like yeah it just didn't sound like a, a good experience and then even the sensual and sexual stuff though it was titillating for me also didn't sound like uh, the type of experience that I wanted mm. wow so then when you did have your first sort of a consensual sexual experience with someone was it everything that you'd held out for well <laughs> um i'm a self-proclaimed pleasure slut so when i wanted to finally 
lose my virginity, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I chose a skater boy um, from a nightclub because I didn't want any emotional attachment at all. I just wanted to have sex. I'm like, I just want sex. I don't want a relationship. I don't want to be in love, which is really unusual. Usually like girls, especially they want that relational thing, but I was clear. I just, I just want to know what what cock is. I I have no idea like (laughs) what I'm getting involved with here. I've only used a finger my whole life. And so my first experience, it was just an instinctual uh, choice. I saw this person. I said, he's the one. And he happened to know my friend. My friend kind of connected us. And then a few nights later, we came together. And it was, for what it was, extraordinary. And I remember just laying there afterwards, tingling from the toes to my head in a way I've never tingled before or after. Like it was it was like something got activated in a really profound, I just laid there for an hour, hour and a half tingling, just like, wow, what was that? The sad part for me is that he went back to my friend and said, she certainly was not a virgin. So I don't know what you were talking about. Um, but that was because I had been my own best lover my entire life. So my first experience, I had no pain. I had orgasms instantly. I just like, and throughout the experience and, was very free and very vocal. And so this is the advantage that knowing your own body and being your own best lover can have. And the disadvantage of when we make those things dirty or shameful or bad that we give to individuals, because we really are our own most extraordinary lovers. And it does Mm -hmm. lend to having better experiences. Totally. It all starts with how we pleasure ourselves and how we treat ourselves. And like I I didn't self-pleasure until well after I had had sex for the first time. I was like so, so, so triggered and averse to the thought of, oh, how gross, like touching myself. No, no, no. Um, and I probably had sex for the first time when I was 15 or 16 and I didn't actually self-pleasure or attempt that until I was 19 or 20. And even then I was like glad wrapping my fingers because I didn't want to actually touch my own pussy. So um, it wasn't until, you know, I'd, I'd started familiarizing myself with my own body and getting comfortable with self-pleasuring, mm-hmm. with having pleasure with making sound to accentuate and enhance my pleasure and just getting comfortable with like moving my hips and all of these things. Um, it wasn't until then that my sex with other people started becoming rewarding and enjoyable. So fully back. Amazing. That. Yes. <sighs> we should have met um, as little girls. <laughs> hey, I said we should have met as little girls. I started teaching other little girls. I think I was five <laughs> years old. And I was like, they need to know about this. This is so amazing. And I literally was running like a little circle showing little girls where the special spot was. Because I was like, you girls need to know this. This is amazing. Oh, my God. (laughs) If only no one was doing that shit for me. That would have been phenomenal. Right. Um, Yeah, wow. So, all right. I want to make sure we get time to talk about jade egg practices because that's actually how I heard of you when when I first uh, I was doing my yoni mapping therapy training about eight years ago, and we had a practitioner come in to teach us some jade egg. Uh, practices and she was trained by you and we all got given your book as part of our practitioner kit when we first signed up. And so I've got you. I've had your book for years. I've lent it out to lots of different people, um, and. And I remember at the time Bonnie mentioning that you were ha- you were getting some research happening that was actually going to really legitimize, at least in the eyes of like the more sort of like research community, Western medical model, these practices. And she was like, this is kind of crazy because like so much of these practices are, you know, considered like esoteric and very fringe and very woo-woo. And so when I was reading in your bio that, um, yeah, you mentioned medically endorsed method, I was like, oh, is this referring to, because I haven't really checked in again with um, where you're at with all of that research, are you referring to jade egg practices? Like what is this medically endorsed method that you're talking about and and what's yes. some of the research behind that? Yeah, so uh, that's a big question to answer. 
<laughs> I'm a bit of a geek. So even though I opened myself up to learning from all different spectrums of what was available, which is not that much if you think about it, but you know, you need to go and, and try things. Um, I was still like suspicious. I've always had this kind of scientific brain, mathematical brain, as well as a super sensual adventurous part. So they're like always in conversation. And as I was learning practices and I went very deep into particular lineages. Um, so some of it is movement, some of it is body work, some of it's healing work, and some of it is literally like sexual practice from different lineages. What I started to recognize, and it was confirmed later in uh, as I progressed on my career, that uh, the only say most of the practices involve slowing down your breath and breathing more deeply, and then breathing into the lower belly and pelvic floor. Any pelvic floor therapist will tell you like that's the primary way for for good sexual health. Just that. So. All the the woo woo ness. Just think of it as ancient people having nothing better to do, being fascinated by this incredible energy that we call sexual energy. How to harness it? Because they noticed that when they did, they felt younger. They had more inspiration, more creativity, all of that good stuff. And you fast forward to now, like where were the breakthroughs that we're having, and how we can do brain scans and body scans and all of that. And, different layers and types of breathing, we need to honor that these people had no technology except their own body. So honestly, the reason it's woo is just because the language from those days didn't have the scientific technical language we have now, but those people I think would have used the language if they had had access to it. So one of the things I noticed is the the so I've had uh, many gynecologists, doctors, osteopaths, and uh, pelvic pain specialists do my jade egg course, and they've all endorsed it. And they've taken me through like what's counterindicative, what's actually good. And so, yes, there's, I've done my own, um, my PhD is based on looking on the impact of this method on the psychosexual well-being of women. And now I'm in the process of co-authoring a medical protocol uh, that will revolutionize how uh, professionals deal with sexual dysfunction and sexual optimization. So the foundation of that medical protocol is this work that I've come to understand. And we can't separate how we orient our mind. So our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs, our uh, all of those kinds of awarenesses they're they're intertwined so deeply with the somatic that they're they're not separate. So when I started working with women and their bodies, I started to understand, oh, oh, this is something incredibly precious. We we can't be, pardon my language, but effing around here. We we need to be very aware of what it is that we're doing. Because the psychic space, when you start to, as you know, work with the genitals it can really open up a massive amount of different psychological experiences, emotional experiences, all kinds of things can emerge as we heal the tissue. So as I was going through my method and healing myself and then eventually students and eventually professionals, then I started to meet other professionals and realize I've literally been doing trauma-informed therapy my entire career. I just had no idea because I wasn't specifically trained in that. But because I had so much trauma, the, the, the thing had to be informed because I was messed up in a really bad way. Then I started to notice I met someone who does neural sculpting, which is literally the rewriting of your neural pathways. And I realized, oh, almost all the practices that I lead women through, ha it, the, that's what they're doing. They're literally rewriting the neural pathways in this person. And then I worked with a gynecologist and we literally did pelvic exams and mapped out what was happening there. And what we witnessed is a complete regeneration and repatterning of cellular. Well, the recellular memory is more the psychological piece, but the actual physiological changes that we could witness, she'd never seen anything in her entire career. She said it 
this is not scientifically possible, but we're witnessing it here over and over and over and over again. So that piece of research, unfortunately, is just sitting on a shelf. Uh, she got very sick and it's almost ready to like press go. And I've been waiting for like two, three years now to like, can we just publish this? Because it's such an important piece of information that has not yet been published. However, it has informed my work in really, really massive ways. So when I say it's medically endorsed, it's because I've had so many professionals look at it kind of like go through it and go, yes, and it is literally prescribed by these doctors to their patients. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Yes. Wow. Excuse the interruption, my loves, but I'm shamelessly seeking reviews and five-star ratings for the potty because, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, it's pretty fab. And the more people who get to hear it, the more people it can help. Reviews and ratings help me curry favor with the algorithmic gods and get suggested to other listeners to check out. Plus, they make me feel really good and appreciated as I continue to pour my heart and soul into creating this baby for you. And I promise I don't maz over them or anything. I mostly just tuck them away for a rainy day when I'm filled with self-doubt and existential dread about being self-employed, which is fairly frequently. (laughs) So you see, leaving a review really does make a difference and it's an easy little act of support that you can take in just a minute or two by either going to Spotify and leaving five stars for the show or writing a written review and leaving five stars over on Apple Podcasts. Choose your poison, or if you're a real overachiever, you could do both. Whoa now. If you are writing a review, though, just be sure to only use G-rated words, because despite the fact that this is a podcast about sexuality, words like sex can be censored and your review won't actually show up. Lame. Anyway, oh, oh, what was that? Oh, you're going to go do it right now while I wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great idea. May as well just quickly click that five-star button before we get on with it and, you know, like forget about it and get on with your day. Um, um, oh, I'm hearing them roll in. I'm hearing those five stars. <laughs> oh my God, I make myself cringe. Anyway, uh, thank you much, Lee. You're a total gem and I'll let you get back to the episode now. Yeah, that's phenomenal. So what is it? Let's chat a bit. I mean, it's a huge topic. I, I remember being like really taken aback um, when I, because I was like, oh, jade egg, you know, you pop it in, you might do some vaginal weightlifting, you might squeeze, do some yoga, whatever. That's that. But then I got your book. It's like, okay, this is like an entire way of life. There is so much more to this. Um, and I was a little bit overwhelmed actually, because I'm, I'm sometimes resistant to actually like having the self-discipline to, to, be consistent with practices like this. Um, so even just this chat, I'm like, all right, I got to get that book out again and just have another, <laughs> have another crack at it. Um, but talk us through the basics um, around, yeah, I don't know if you call it like a protocol or a like, because it's it's not just around the jade egg; it's an entire yes. modality, I so, suppose. Yeah. Um, a lot of what's in my book are practices I created myself because the way that jade egg was traditionally given was more it, the first Montek Chia book was written by eight men. There were no women involved. Um, mm. And then the posture was a horse stance. And you pop the egg in and you do your strong, um, deeper breaths with the vagina. And then eventually you hang weights. So there was really nothing that sensual about it. And certainly my body went in full rejection mode. As I popped the egg in, it went shooting across the room and like slammed into the wall. And I was like, oh, okay, we don't really want that, do we? So I had to do a lot of adaptations, which is where the lying down practice came into being. And back in 2001, I was invited by Montak Chia to his center to bring that version of the practice to his world And then they adopted that immediately. So it went into all their jade egg brochures and then their newer books um, started to adopt also those practices. Unfortunately, I wasn't doing a teacher training. So anyone and everyone who's come out of that school (laughs) has been doing my practices incorrectly (laughs) for a long time. Mm -hmm. It used to irritate me. I'm like, why are they copycatting and then doing a poor job? But then I realized they weren't copying me. They were literally being trained by people who weren't properly trained. So that that was the unfortunate 
part. Mm. So just so you know, like some things came from that original kind of school, but a lot of it I let go of and then had to kind of listen to my body. And then the next step was, can this work for another woman? Because obviously I am, have had an unusual upbringing, but can it work for other women? And I started wick, literally working with thousands and thousands. Like after a while, it's just lot, you lose count, but all ages. And they would give me feedback. So the method was based on real time working with women, getting direct feedback and noticing what was working, what was not working and how to start adapting. So the system that you saw in the book that arrived after many years of personal practice and then working with individuals and refining it. And even now it's been since the book, the book is old. Um, I have a much more modern say Jade egg class online. And even that class is now like needing to be updated because I'm always growing and researching more and getting more refined. The people I'm qualifying now to work on this level, they're now bringing their insights. So I have also qualified doctors who are doing this stuff and other types of therapists. And then just regular women who are like, I want to work with women. I already have small groups. Like I just want to improve this. So the method essentially is a somatic method in in the sense that we're going to work directly with the body. It is sexual in the sense that we involve the genitals and it's psychosexual in that we the entire time are attuning ourselves to how we feel. Where's my mind? Where's my attention? Am I in a yes or a no as I'm moving through every single stage of practicing? So it doesn't really matter, but my research at the end of the day kind of disappointed me, Freya, I have to admit. <laughs> I wanted to show which was the most magical technique that was going to solve everything for women. And, and when my mathematician, statistician came back and he's like, well, we need to look at this stat. And essentially the most powerful thing was, um, what was it? It was lasting transformation, positive lasting transformation even with participants who never practiced. So I was like, what? what? Exactly. So that flipped my entire career. And I started to realize, no, it's my limbic resonance that's number one. It's what I'm embodying. So the transmission is essential and crucial here. Two, it's the framework. When I introduced a new way of perceiving oneself or in orienting oneself, that's enough to create the transformation. If we want to make it more robust, then it's supplemented by the physical practices. Then, of course, if you want to just kind of access your most optimal sexual self, then the physical practices must be intertwined with the psychosexual. And that will give you kind of the Olympic level <laughs> access to, to your pleasure. But there are these phases. So I stopped being a really regimented instructor after that. I started to understand the space that I hold is the most instrumental piece and so I, I started teaching less technique and creating more opportunity and invitation for deep listening, more opportunity for sharing, and then giving less is more. So very uh, specific practice. So I can talk about one of those if you like, but very specific practices that have incredible impact. So there's probably two that we can talk about now. One is just simply hand on heart and hand on lower belly or genitals. Now that's something that even a child does when they sleep. But what in my career, that is the, the most profound practice anyone can do if we want to reweave um, our deep emotional selves with our sexual selves. We need to practice opening and softening the heart and the front body. It is crucial. If this part is closed, maybe you're even having great sex, but afterwards you're going to feel like either apathy or a shame hangover or something's contracting because who you are as a being 
is an emotional and sensual being. So kind of keeping that closed because you don't want emotion to be emotionally involved or you're trying to protect your heart is just BS. You're not protecting your heart when you're closing your heart. You're just harming yourself on a psychological level. So this is a huge practice. Just opening the heart is probably one of the most profound lovemaking trainings you can do. As a woman, it's not easy because we've been betrayed. We've had heartbreak. We've been disappointed in ourselves and others. We've betrayed our own bodies. Like there's just so much just there. So this is a lifelong practice. How can I deeply respect and love myself? That's just part one of this whole thing. It's a very, very rich experience. Then to acknowledge the womb space, the genitals themselves. And this is true for men and women. So this practice works for all bodies. Um, But I'm speaking to women now. So honoring the sexual organs as a place that is worthy of our attention, worthy of deep, deep, deep respect and worthy of fascination and wonderment and being able to spend time listening and sensing. And I tell you, Freya, I'm sure you know this for yourself, but it's an endless discovery. And I, I'm still at this point somatically refining and developing after all these years to the point where now it's like the tiniest engorgement in any structure of my genitals, I can feel it and I can sense it and I can tell you specifically where it is. I can feel, if I touch my clitoris, I will feel warmth spreading down, going down the clitoral legs. It's very distinct. I never had felt that before. I can then feel the engorgement of the urethral sponge inside the body and then the pulsing that starts to happen there Mm -hmm. just by placing a finger and not even stimulating the clitoris, but just touching the clitoris, that kind of somatic awareness. Or the reverse, putting a finger inside and then feeling all the sensation going through the structures until the tip of the clitoris is like pulsing. Without movement, this is just somatic awareness. So this internal mapping, as you your work is uh, a lot about, is so, so crucial for building that. And it cannot be separate from our psyche, from how we orient in the space, from how we consider ourselves. So that one simple practice is a phenomenal practice. And sex therapists everywhere, counselors everywhere could just give that to trauma victims and have an immense level of healing and therapy that could happen. And that's it's one of my missions. It's just to that one practice, like really have the therapist understand it and then just have it going out everywhere in all time and space because it's so, so important. Yeah, absolutely. I think something that I come up against is that people have it in their heads that more is more. And when they, when you give them a practice or you explain something to them that just seems too simple or too easy, they kind of discount it or discredit it or, you know, poo poo it because it's like, well, that's so tiny and so simple. Like, how can that possibly make much of a difference? And so they just don't even do it. Um, or they're confronted because it requires such stillness and awareness that like we've spent our whole lives running from and trying to distract ourselves from because it's too difficult to actually be present with ourselves in that way so I I wonder if um you can give just uh, for the listeners who have never done anything like this and they're sort of hearing okay so I need to learn to listen to my pussy I need to just have that sort of somatic awareness How, what would the first step be if they've got total numbness, they cannot feel their clitoral legs, they cannot differentiate parts of their yonis, where do they start just if they're at home and they're sitting in their bed, like what can they do to drop into that? Well, first, uh, again, if this area of your heart is closed or tight, it's going to be harder to sense and feel what's happening in the pelvic area. So what you want to do is just maybe like massage the area between the breasts, the chest, maybe even just rest your hands between the breasts or even on the breasts and just take some time to relax. We're very tight. We're nervous people. We're anxious. We are stressed. This um, chest area gets very, very tight. So this you want to soften. And then you want to feel 
like that softness starts to travel down. So you soften the solar plexus and belly area. And then you keep that softness, that warmth traveling down and just having even placing, if you're not ready yet to touch your genitals, right over the lowest part of your belly above the pubic bone. And you can just rest there and allow the heat and the warmth of your hand, but also the awareness that you're here with yourself, that you're generating respect and that you're just going to move as fast as the slowest part right now. And the slowest part happens to be the vulva, which isn't feeling anything. That's okay. I call her the sleeping beauty. And when she's ready, she will awaken, but not because we force her to. So just hand on the lower belly. If you are comfortable, hand right over the vulva and you're not doing anything. You're just sensing with your hand first, the shape and feeling of having your hand over your own vulva. What does that feel like? Is there warmth? Is there tingling? What, what are you picking up through your hand? And then reverse the awareness, become your vulva, feeling your hand, the weight of your hand, the heat of your hand, the shape of your hand, just that. While the other hand is still connected to your heart and reminding you, this is, um, this is, a, it's actually a very sacred experience. And that is lovemaking, just that. You don't need fancy things. You don't need an orgasm. You don't need the latest clitoral technique or vaginal technique or fancy toy. Just be with. And then I would say, keep a yoni journal, like write whatever or pussy journal, however you want to say it, but keep a journal afterwards. Like what comes up for you? What came up during? Sometimes it'll be gobbledly goop, like literally does not make sense. Or the, you know, weird things will come out. And other times you're going to get this incredible insight. And what you're doing with this simple practice is rebuilding trust, first of all, with your body, secondly, with your own inner emotional self, and then thirdly, with your genitals. And trust takes time. It takes patience and gentleness, but it will build more and more. And just doing that, eventually your body's like, oh, she doesn't want anything from me. Oh, I don't have to perform oh, I don't have to look a certain way. Oh, she does care for me. Oh, I am being respected. And you will feel a natural engorgement start to happen in the vulva. You'll feel, and when that engorgement ha arises, more sensation may arise. Now, a caveat to that is that there's a lot of numbness. <clears throat> when that starts to melt, there can be pain. So to not be afraid of that because that is a stepping stone toward the pleasure. But you know, when you, um, you have a numb arm, you've sat on your arm a funny way or, and then it's asleep. And then when the blood comes back, it hurts it's like, ah, it's the same thing when an area has been numb and then the blood flow starts to come and enervate this area. It's going to feel uncomfortable or even intensely painful. And then if you just stay relaxed and keep breathing, eventually you will be able to move toward at least neutral and then eventually to pleasure. Mm, yeah, beautiful. And so with regards to the use of the jade egg, what do you think about the kind of uh, – there's all – it's become really trendy, right? Like it's, it's mm -hmm. super trendy. Everyone's got a, you know, jade egg and a crystal dildo and – um, even a friend sent me sent me this reel the other day from Kim Anami about vaginal weightlifting, and I feel like she's uh, really made that trendy. And it was also kind of saying like, you know, vaginal weightlifting is the only way to go. Like, if you have a weak pussy, then it's going to be dry, and if you weightlift with your vagina, you'll be like wet all the time, and you know, you shouldn't be using lube um, because it means you're not horny enough, and all of these things. And she was like, "Hey, what do you think of this?" And I was just like, "Oh God, it's just yeah, sure, it's true. Maybe if you have a more like strength, like toned, articulate." pelvic floor then you'll lubricate more easily and you might be able to feel more sensation and pleasure and maybe you'll be more connected to that area of your body of course but I found it so problematic to you know hear that uh, it was just very I was like oh god poor women who see this and just feel like shit because mm -hmm. 
maybe they do need to use lube sometimes. And there's a thing called arousal non-concordance, which contributes to sometimes the genitals not reflecting your, you know, level of arousal. Exactly. It's just, it's just a demonstration of immaturity and inappropriateness and using marketing to make money off people's insecurities. Um, it's not technically that safe. I, I also train women in, in weightlifting, but only in person. I would, I never have ever filmed a single video because I need to see your posture. I need to see how you're breathing. I need to, the Jade egg is not a sex toy. It's not an, uh, something you're doing like a sex gym. It's something much more profound. It is, um, something we can use for transformation. But what I started to realize in the first four weeks of my Jade egg course, there's no Jade egg involved at all because you don't technically really need it in order for all these things to start to happen. And if you're overriding yourself and you're still shut down, sticking an egg in and just trying to make something happen is not going to help you, not in the long term. Mm. Um, I have helped women who were way past menopause, hadn't had sex in over 10 years, their husbands were going crazy, total dryness, total atrophy, within six months, be really juicy, have their vaginal walls thicken again and be super sexual with their partners. And it's not because they were weightlifting or forcing anything. It was reestablishing, first of all, home base, normalizing that women post-menopause, it's actually the most sexual time of life, not the least. And once we reorient to that, and start to actually look at, well, what does turn me on because it's going to be different than in my early 20s, et cetera, then things can start to happen. But um, now that you understand erotic individuation, videos like that are incredibly offensive to me because they're shaming the majority and they're making incredible assumptions. And it's based on trickery, really, because it's like I don't have to lift that much weight to be the most extraordinary lover in the on the planet. I used to, I had to lift a lot of weight in order to graduate one of the trainings that I did. And they didn't have a weight at the time of my examination. So they literally hung a Lao Tzu statue between my legs. (laughs) So I had to stand there with the instructors all watching me, like holding this Lao Tzu uh, statue for like several minutes and just breathing. So that's, Anyone can do that. You can train your body to do tricks, but that's not going to give you the most extraordinary, most magnificent, ecstatic sexual experiences of your life. Being at home with yourself, getting to be your own best friend, your own best lover, discovering the nuances of what, like the vulva, the whole of your genitals, we haven't even started to understand what this is as an extraordinary structure. There's only little hints because it's the most underfunded research on the planet. So there's hints that the different innervations, for example, the pelvic nerve, which is only deep, it's around the cervix and the womb. It doesn't go much further into the vaginal canal. So the deeper work when you're learning to move the egg or use, you know, play with moving your cervix up and down in the vagina, these kind of movements, you're stimulating, especially if you're relaxed and your heart's open, you're stimulating what I call relaxed arousal. And they have mapped out that the areas of the brain that light up in these cases, creativity, confidence, Mm. and transcendent states. Like that's extraordinary. Mm. But the research isn't, funded well enough for us to go deeper, but we will go deeper. And it is partly I'm teaming up with another researcher soon with an app called BrainTap, where we're going to start really looking at these things in very specific ways and getting some stuff published because it's so important that people understand how precious and powerful our genitals actually are and how important genuine pleasure is and not pornographic performance-based pleasure but deep, natural, organic pleasure that is your own signature of pleasure. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's it's so um, 
oh, it's so it makes me cringe and it makes me angry when I see, uh, I guess, things like in particular, like, you know, this whole vaginal weightlifting trend, just commodify our insecurities basically. And, and yeah, it's, ex- it's exactly as you said, it's shaming like the majority. And it's also focusing on like, yeah, doing tricks like a monkey as opposed to the whole underlying, um, you know, framework that you've talked us through. And I feel like what I see a fair bit Um, in my work with yoni mapping and vaginal massage is like chronic pelvic floor tension is absolutely Mm. rife and these people it's often yogis it's often people who like think they have really strong pelvic floors and do all the kegels and the the weightlifting and stuff and next minute they're having incontinence or they're having numbness or they can't orgasm or they're having painful sex because they have these like incredibly tight pelvic floors that are not toned and articulate and supple and able to actually release and relax into pleasure. They're just like only trained to squeeze and clench and contract um, and constrict the blood flow. And it's just like, yeah, it's just creating weakness and disconnect from the pelvic floor. And so when I see, yeah, I see like, oh, like these vaginal weightlifting ads and oh my God, it just makes me shake my head because yeah, it's not even particularly helpful to just do those physical, um, you know, the physical JDAG practices. Like you were saying, it's such a small part of it. And <laughs> you were disappointed when the research started to show you that like, actually it wasn't even about that. Um, so yeah, it's so fascinating. And um it's it's sort of yeah inspired me to to get back into I just remember even when I first started exploring with jade egg the most basic thing which was the sipping like the lying down mm-hmm. and allowing your yoni exactly. to eat more the egg in that was so hard to learn because we're just so used to kind of shoving things in and helping it along with our finger that I didn't have it took quite a while to like uh, actually get the the control and the awareness over my pelvic floor muscles to draw it into my body and also the relaxation that's required to like soften exactly. and up. Exactly. So really interesting because I don't think anyone thinks of that when they think of jade egg practices. They think of like weightlifting and contracting and just like doing exercises, whereas it's exactly. more about letting go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that sipping exercise is rather extraordinary too, because the opening of the vagina has um, cell receptors that are called girth receptors. And if you bypass those, you bypass a really important signaling that is an arousal signaling to the whole of the vagina, which creates more lubrication, more blood flow, more arousal. So just shoving something in, you're literally bypassing that by spending time yawning, intentionally opening your vagina, like you open your throat and your mouth, like oh, you do that big yawn with your mouth, your throat, and then you feel that happening in the vagina. And then you have that very gentle pulsing instead of a contraction. What you're doing essentially is stimulating the, those girth receptor cells and mm-hmm. signaling to the rest of the vagina, it is time to get engorged and full of juiciness. <laughs> so but just the sipping alone is a a very very profound um, practice it's also incredibly useful for consent and for um, modulating two very different nervous systems from the giver side and the, the receiving side so that as you're taking your time and drawing someone into you you're you're also harmonizing the nervous system so that you can be in sync with each other. If you're just shoving something in, typically the giver will be moving far too quickly for the receiver. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's um it's a massive thing that I teach as well is just that that the way that you actually enter or allow someone to enter. And like when I make love, I, you know, I almost sort of just dwell in that space where just the tip, just the head of the penis is just inside the entrance and actually give my yoni enough time to, it's almost like, it's like chewing your food and starting to like macerate. It's like the first stage of digestion before you swallow it. And then it reaches your stomach and your stomach's kind of already got those acids going to digest it. That's kind of how I see it. It's like, you know, prepping, preheating, giving them, giving the rest of the yoni a bit of a heads up. Like this is what's happening. 
This is what's coming. It's not coming at a crazy pace, non-consensually. It's not just being shoved inside. You're in control. It's going to happen at your your yes. pace and you're going to draw draw this thing in. Um, and yeah, the, number so one, they- the number one myth with the jade egg is that we need tighter pussies. And mm. so everyone thinks, and this is how I know they're not properly trained, Everyone thinks that if you do these practices, your muscles can hold the egg in. What they fail to understand is there's no contractions holding any egg in. If you do the practice properly, you develop your erectile tissue to the point where it healthily engorges. And that is what holds the egg in, not muscular contractions. So people who think that they can be extraordinary eggers by having all this contraction power are actually completely inhibiting some really important sexual functions for ecstatic sex. Basic sex, sure, clitoral oriented sex, fine. But if you want deeper ecstatic sex that involves also the pelvic nerve and these other nerves that that are also involved, you cannot be having these kinds of really intense contractions because you're inhibiting the signaling. Mm. So that's how I know the majority are not trained properly is this weird idea that like somehow they're walking around like, that's why pelvic therapists hate the jade egg. And I completely agree with them. I'm like, yes, it's creating dysfunction. It's terrible. But the way that I teach it is not like that. So we, so I'm not that well known in the sphere, really. I would like to be better known just for this piece, at least help women have a better experience. But it's the extravagant and extraordinary and loud mouth, let's say, marketers that really can get the attention. And then I listen to them like, I don't mind you have the attention if you actually said something that was reasonable and useful and actually practical. But everything you're saying is just sensational, it's not useful. It actually can be harmful. So uh, I don't advocate for that kind of jade egg practice at all, at all. I'm actually against it. And I'm, I definitely would agree with doctors and therapists that the jade egg done that way is actually not healthy for a woman. But if you do do it in the right way and you do develop your erectile tissue, you are setting yourself for a lifetime of great sexual health, incredible amounts of pleasure, and sovereignty, because whether or not you're partnered, having the capacity to feel yourself that deeply is incredibly, it's confidence building, it's, uh, you get a sense of being at home in yourself. And then the most subtle pleasures become ecstatic because you've developed this sensibility in the, of the subtleness and the beauty that is available within an activated um, pussy. Mm, yeah yeah word love it love your approach it's such a it's such an interesting topic and it's yeah I know what it's like to be frustrated by people's assumptions about a certain thing that you're an expert in and they think it's this thing and you're like no 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 I don't practice like that like I get that heaps as a yoni mapping therapist I'm constantly having to dispel myths and explain the way that I actually work in comparison to how some more you know problematic practitioners work um so yeah I feel I feel you and I just wanted to see if I could harvest a little TMI story from you before we wrap up because I'm just conscious of time and I have like a million questions I'd love. To, maybe we can do a part two down the track after your <laughs> tour. But um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So do you have a TMI story to send us off with? Oh gosh, I probably have many uh, <laughs> TMI stories. Um, uh, let's see what would be a really good one. Mm, I'm trying to see what, like, if my mother heard this podcast, would she be okay with it? I have a very small listener base and it's nice <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just like thinking, what would be really good? Um, basically most of my, uh, sex life is, um, first experimented on my own and then I get curious about trying things with partners. So I had a moment in my development where I'm like, okay, cause I was anally raped. So that was an area I needed to reclaim. And so I was like, no, no anal sex, no touching, no nothing. And eventually I was like, I need to reclaim this because 
I hear good things and, you know, whatever. So I got very interested in it. Simultaneously, I was hearing about this thing called, quote unquote, fisting. So I'm like, what's that? And like, how does that work? And do I even want that or not want that? So <laughs> part of the journey, I, I experimented with myself in the shower, and that was extraordinary. But part of the journey is I was teaching at a uh, kind of like a, like a leather BDSM conference. I'm not that, but I was brought in as a teacher for the dating stuff for that conference. And there was um, a really famous porn star woman who's incredibly conscious. I mean, she's more spiritual than a lot of the spiritual teachers I've met. She's like an amazing woman. And then there was this other woman who was like the anal sex expert of the day. Like she was just famous for all her anal stuff. And I'm like, Ooh, do you two want to play with me? And that's not something that I even do. It, it was just, it just hit me. I'm at this thing, this conference, like, you know, these are professionals. I could have this experience. I don't know why I want it. I'll probably never want it again, but let's like, you know, if they're open, let's see. And they were like, what really? Yay. So they totally were excited Threw me in some kind of a uh, sling thingy. Uh, so I'm hanging in this room. There's like 60 or 70 people like around, but I'm like ignoring them all. And the porn star just starts with my pussy because that was her specialty. The anal sex lady la literally lays on the floor and like reaches up. And so she's starting with my, my ass. And I don't know where we got to, but I think they both got quite far. All I know is I went from zero to 50,000 in a very short period of time, had insane um, orgasm. And then I flatlined and I didn't want sex for like quite some time. And so it taught me something really important because the way I typically have sex isn't wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and all this exciting stuff and intense stimulation. It, there's kind of a progressional opening that I prefer. And then I can go on literally for hours and then I'm in desire and pleasure for days. Like, so I was used to that. So to flatline after I was like, whoa, what happened there? And I think what happened there was there was so much stimulation with the pudendal nerve, which is the one that innervates your clitoris that it just flatlined me. Cause I'm not, um, don't tend to overly focus on the pudendal nerve in my system. So it was a really good experience. Never want to have it again. Got the t-shirt, done the thing. Uh, <laughs> definitely TMI, but I learned a lot from it. And I, and that's when I, after that, I was like, yeah, I think I'm definitely into anal as well now. Like, cause I definitely got that sorted out. So, oh <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> hey, me again. If you'd like to support the potty and you've already given it five stars on whatever platform you're listening on, I want to mention that you can buy some really dope merch from the website and get yourself a labia lounge tote, tea, togs. Yep, you heard that right. I even have labia lounge bathers or a cute fanny pack if that'd blow your hair back. So uh, if fashion isn't your passion, though, you can donate to my buy me a coffee donation page, which is actually called buy me a soy chai latte because... I'll be the first to admit, I'm a bit of a Melbourne cafe tosser like that. And yes, that is my coffee order. <laughs> you can do a once-off donation or an ongoing membership and sponsor me for as little as three fat ones a month. And I also have a Sunroom profile over on the Sunroom app, as I've mentioned. And I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching and online courses that'll help you level up your sex life and relationship with yourself and others in a really big way. So every bit helps because it ain't cheap to put out a sweet podcast uh, into the world every week out of my own pocket. So I will be undyingly grateful if you support me and my biz financially in any of these ways. And if you like, I'll even give you a mental BJ with my mind from the lounge itself. Saucy. And, um, I'll pop the links in the show notes. Thank you. Later. <laughs> Perfect. I'm jealous. That sounds like the perfect opportunity to like be initiated into butt stuff. Like, whoa. So yeah. hang on. You mentioned fisting in the beginning. Did she wind up fisting you? Was that your like? That was my thing? feeling is that both of them oh. ha had as many fingers as yeah. they I couldn't see because I was in the sling. So, but yeah. the feeling I had was that at some point everything really just opened 
they were yeah. very, very skilled. So I was not harmed in any way. I wasn't hurt in any yeah. way. I wasn't deformed in any way. Um, everything was very functional after. Mm. It's just that energetically I'd flatlined and was not interested mm. in sex for quite a few days yeah. um, after that mm. experience, which is weird because I literally am a person who can have sex all day, every day, all night. Like I'm just ready. So to, to flatline was such an unusual thing. And that's, I learned, I much prefer edging. I much prefer the slower paced types of pleasure, uh, just because it's way more satisfying and healthier for my nervous system. And it was, as you said, a fantastic experience makes for a fantastic story. I think the porn star eventually, she wrote a, a little article on me in that experience. Cause she was sort of like blown away that some pretty straight chick, like, <laughs> like asked for this experience but again it wasn't an orientation thing it was these women really know what they're doing I want to have a very specific experience where else in the world am I going to have this unless I go somewhere and pay for something so it was just my I guess my body and my mind felt a yes and Mm -hmm. I felt safe And the detail I didn't share is that my fiance was actually there holding my head and he was just, did not know what oh. to do. <laughs> With all of that. Oh, he was overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. I bet. But that's yeah. just, yeah. I mean, I would be just as opportunistic if there was like a situation that just fell into my lap where like, you're never going to find yourself like no. having that opportunity again, you know, to be like with such professionals, you're in such safe hands, you know, they're creating a safe space for you to explore this thing that you probably yes. wouldn't normally have the opportunity to. So like, yeah, fuck it. Love that for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, maybe it's too much information, but there you go. <laughs> That was perfect. Very on brand. You nailed the brief. Um, So thank you so much. I'm going to pop your links and offerings in the show notes. Is there anything else you wanted to just plug or words of wisdom you wanted to leave us with? Anything you feel like you didn't cover off before we wrap up? Well, my latest passion is I've teamed up with someone called Aaron Michael, which you've also had him on your show. And we created something called Nine Naughty Nights. It's basically nine dates. And that's basically something I'm thinking is pretty extraordinary because people can learn a whole kind of more juicy way of connecting um, over nine different dates. And it doesn't, it's not scary. Uh, All the videos are closed on. But the couples who've been through it have had an extraordinary time. They feel closer. They want to have sex more. They're juicier. They last longer. Like there's just some really fantastic feedback on that. Um, so I think it's just nine naughty nights.com is what that one is. Beautiful. Love it. Amazing. Yeah. I had Aaron on, it'll be last week on the podcast. So yeah, that's exciting. Good to have you guys back to back and hear about your latest endeavors seems like a bit of a dream team that you've got going on at the moment so all right well I'll put the link to that in the show notes as well and I'll leave you to get on with the rest of your day thank you and that's it darling hearts thank you for stopping by the labia lounge your bum groove in the couch will be right where you left it just waiting for you to sink back in for some more double l action next time and in the meantime if you'd be a dear and subscribe share this episode or leave a review on itunes then you can pat yourself on the snatch because that my dear is a downright act of sex positive feminist activism and you'd be supporting my vision to educate, empower, demystify, and destigmatize with this here podcast. Also, I'm always open to feedback, topic ideas that you'd love to hear covered, or guest suggestions. So feel free to get in touch via my website at freyograph.com or say hey over on Insta. My handle is Freya underscore graph underscore YMT and I seriously hope you're following me on there because damn, we have fun. We have fun. Anyway, later labial legends. I'll see you next time.